Hey Amen. I'd ask you to turn me today to the book of Galatians. Galatians in chapter 5. While you turn there, I just want to take a moment and welcome you to our church. Uh, guests especially, we're always glad to have guests with us, and I hope you feel comfortable and welcome. It's cool, isn't it? It's a little cool in here. It's cool outside, but I'm enjoying the changing of the seasons. It's a wonderful, wonderful time of the year. If you are a guest, we'd ask you to take a moment today and grab a connection card in the seat back in front of you and just jot down a name and a phone number and an email address so we have a way of knowing that you were here, a little bit about who you are so we can reach out to you this week and thank you for your visit. Also, we've still got plenty of donuts out in the foyer. We haven't had them the last few weeks, but Miss Karen went and picked those up today. We're grateful for that. So make sure you grab a donut. Don't leave us with them right? Make sure you eat a donut. We have coffee out there. Restrooms are, of course, in the foyer as well. And if you have children and you're unfamiliar, we do have a nursery through these doors and to the right. If you go to the end of the hall and to the right and up the stairs, that's our preschool area. And then back here in our balcony area is our elementary age classroom. And every week we've got individuals who are teaching these children, not just women, but men, because we're a family-based children's ministry. And so we believe in couples teaching these kiddos. And so we'd ask you to pray for them and for you to consider being involved in that because that's our ministry. The Bible says that we're to teach our children the things of God, and so we do that together as a church. Well, Galatians chapter 5, I just want to read a couple of verses, and then we're going to see what the Spirit of God has to say to us today, starting in verse 13. It says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. I'll always remember the day that my parents dropped me off at college. I was 20 years old, waited a couple of years after graduation of high school to go to college. But I remember my parents dropping us off and then driving away. And I remember that feeling. I mean, you had, first of all, this feeling of fear and uncertainty. You know, it could be sort of like leaving your kids at college. I'm wondering at times, how did they feel going away, you know? I mean, on one hand, they might be like, boom, we're free of them. And at the other hand, it's like, oh, I'm so scared. How are they going to do? What's going to happen to them? And that's how I felt. I had some fear, but at the same time, I had this overwhelming sense of, of freedom. I mean, I can do what I want to do. I can go where I want to go. I can meet people, right? I'm at college. And I remember so many of my friends through college having that attitude. Man, I'm at college. Mom and dad aren't here. Grandma isn't here, so they could do anything they wanted to do. But you know what I noticed about those individuals is they didn't always do very well in college. Like They may have enjoyed that experience of freedom, but at the same time, they struggled with it. And what I learned through that experience is freedom is great, but with freedom comes the necessity for restraint and responsibility. Because unbridled freedom will actually kill you. I mean, you are not free to do absolutely anything that you want to do. That kind of freedom is going to land you in jail, right? I mean, in life, you have freedom, and yet there's a certain amount of restraint that you must learn to exercise. And as I was thinking about that experience, it brought me to this text today. Because we're in a message series called Lessons in Grace. And I personally have really enjoyed this series because I believe that we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Him. And that's it. And this is what makes Christianity unique among all the religions of the world. And we've said it before, but I'll say it again. It bears repeating. Every other religion will say that our standing before God has to do with something that we have done for Him or towards Him. And yet what we believe is that our standing before God has to do with something He has done toward us. He has done for us. So instead of us being the initiators in this thing, God is the initiator. And that's why we call it grace. It's God giving us something we don't deserve. We don't deserve for the one who we have offended to reconcile with us. We are the ones that should be going to him and reconciling with him. But the Bible says that there is a great gap between us and him that has been fixed. And we cannot cross that gap to get to him. So what did he do? He crossed the gap to get to us. And that is what we call grace. And we're saved by grace through faith. But one of the things about grace is that you never really get over it. At least I hope that you don't get over it. I hope it never becomes common or mundane. The Bible says rejoice always in the wife and the spouse of your youth. 
And in the same way, I hope that we never fully get over grace. They were always amazed by it. They were always wowed by it. Because there are ongoing lessons that God wants us to learn about grace. Experiencing grace is not just a one-time thing that we do when we're saved, but it's something where we experience His grace every single day. And we've learned a few lessons. First of all, faith. If we are saved by grace, then we should respond in faith. We've learned about forgiveness. That if God has forgiven us our sins, even though we should not have been forgiven, then we too should forgive others. How can we withhold the forgiveness that God has shown to us? And last week, we talked about freedom. That if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. We are not bound to the sin. We are not bound to law. We are not bound to death. But we are free from these things. So it might feel sort of like (laughs) you've been dropped off at college. It's like God has liberated you from sin. God has liberated you from death. God has liberated you from law. He's liberated you from this guilt that you've been carrying all these years, this feeling of being overwhelmed. And now you realize you're free from these things. There's something that can happen. There's a tendency that we can succumb to. And that is to think, well, now that I'm free in Christ, I can do whatever, right? I am completely free. So I'm free from. But I want you to see this today. We're not just free from things. But the Bible says that we have been freed to things as well. Freedom is not just a negative, where you are liberated, but freedom is a positive, where you are also bound to something else. It says this in the book of Romans, and chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 7. Here Paul is meditating, he's reflecting on the grace of God. And here's what he says, Romans 5, not verse 7, but verse 17. He says, if by the transgression of the one man, death reigned through the one man, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. What did we receive from the one man, Adam? We received the curse of sin, we received the curse of death, and we received the tutorship, if you will, of law. The Bible says we have been freed from those things. But Paul doesn't see us now as free agents, sort of wandering around, roaming around, without any allegiance, without any responsibility, without any liability, right? We are not that way. This is not fundamentally what we seek in life. Just to be wandering around as vagrants and vagabonds with no place to call home? No, We have been freed from a poor master, so we might be joined to a good one. In Adam, we were bound to sin and death and law. But notice, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. We are free from sin and death and law, but church, now we are free to righteousness. What's that? It is having a right standing before God. It is having the very character of God. Before, there was nothing we could do that was good. All of our best efforts were like filthy rags before God. But now we have been bound to righteousness so that all things, get this, are working together for the good of those who love him. The bad stuff we do, the bad stuff that happens to us, God is weaving all of this stuff together to create a greater righteousness in us. Do you see how that works? I mean, this is amazing to me. We are bound to righteousness in such a way where God's righteousness is going to be displayed in us. We are bound not only to his righteousness, but we are bound to his grace. That grace, the kind of grace that when we come back to God and say, you know, God, you did so much for me. I need to do something for you. God continues to lavish grace upon us to where there's never a repayment of the debt, but always a living in gratitude for it. And not only that, but life. We are bound to life, eternal life, life that we experience not only in eternity, but get this, life of eternity that we experience now. It is life of the age. It is the age to come breaking into our world now so that it is inescapable, 
That God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for us. Hey, you're free. But that doesn't mean that you're a free agent, a wanderer, a vagabond, one without roots, without connectedness. No, there is responsibility. And just because God has liberated you from the world and brought you into this place of grace does not mean now that, well, I can just do whatever I want. No, God has brought you into a university, into a school of grace for you to learn and be tutored in that. To do more, to become more, to think more about, your, about him. And so I want today to talk to you about some of the limiting factors in life. This may sound like a downer. Preacher's going to talk to me about some limiting factors. And hey, preachers are good at this. We love to talk about the things that you can't do. And the Bible's full of stuff, right? That you can't do. Thou shalt not. You will not this. You will not this. There are negative commandments in Scripture. But I don't want you to think about limiting factors as negatives and downers, but I want you to think of them as positives and as protections. It's sort of like this morning I had a young man come up to me and he said, hey, pastor, I noticed one of these light sockets over here on the wall, you know, it's sort of like, it's not quite in. You want me to get a screwdriver and put that on? the Yes. <laughs> Let's get that thing screwed in a little more tightly. You know, when I was a kid, I always wanted to mess with that thing. I always thought it was a cat. I don't, I don't know why. But the face, it just it looked like a cat to me, you know, and so I was curious about the cat. Well, my mom took that, and she was like, son, the cat bites. Well, I didn't ever want to touch it then, but I was always curious about it, right? But it's a protection. There's a reason that that is there. Is there power in that? Yes, but at the same time, there's some protection that we need, and I believe restraints in our lives. They allow God's power to flow at the same time protecting us from ourselves. So let's talk about three limiting factors to the freedom we have in Christ. And I want you to weigh these by Scripture. All right? Anyone, anytime somebody comes to you and says, hey, here are some restraints that God would have you put around your freedom, you need to question that and think about that. So let's look at it in the Word of God. First of all, I would say a limiting factor to our freedom in Christ is our calling in Christ. If you have your message notes, let's write this down. Our calling in Christ and when I say our calling in Christ, I'm talking about who we are. Who we are. When my kids were born, we had a decision to make. What are we going to call them? We got to pick out some really good names, I think. I love the name Landon. Love the name Nathan. We even gave them middle names after a couple of our favorite uncles, right? Tyler. I wonder where that came from. Uncle Wayne, you know, Daniel. We call Nathan Daniel. Wendy and I had the privilege of naming these boys. But here's what I want you to get from that. They didn't have a say in the matter. They didn't get to say, wait a minute, I don't like that name. I know some of us wish we could have raised our hand in the hospital and said that. Would you please not name me that? I mean, you hear some of these names and you kind of wonder, what were they thinking? But the reality is, the parent has the right to name the child. And so I want to say this. If God is your father, he has the right to name you. And I'm not talking about Jonathan or Wendy. I'm not talking about Kim or Ryan. Or, no, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way he identifies you. And his calling on your life and his calling over you is a limiting factor in your life. In other words, your responsibility is to live in accordance with your calling. But I didn't choose that calling, no but it chose you. And you have a good father. Who are we in Christ? Number one, we are sons of God. Write this down. We are sons of God. Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Some of my favorite verses. These are good ones to memorize. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Let's walk through these and see this calling. It says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world did not know us, because it did not know him. Verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, though, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. How has God showed his love toward us? 
in what he calls us. He calls us children of God. Children of God. That means that we have a connection with him. It is not a genetic connection, but it is a spiritual connection where God has adopted us into his family. We are not born into his family. We are born again into his family. We are not natural born children. There is only one only begotten son of God, and that is Jesus Christ. But through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, we are adopted into the family of God on the same basis as sons. And so when we became sons of God, our destiny changed, our future changed. We took on a brand new name, a brand new inheritance, a brand new work. Everything about us changed. But if that is true, then something follows. Verse 3, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. I mean, we like to think about that. Wow, I'm a child of God. But what does that mean? I mean, if you're a child of God, what does that mean for you? It means you need to look like your father. You need to behave like your father. You need to show the family resemblance. And what does the father look like? Well, here's what he looks like. Purity. Our small group is memorizing through some of the Beatitudes. And one of the Beatitudes we memorized is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Why is it that the pure in heart see God? Because God is pure. And how can you see a pure God through impure eyes? Listen, if he is pure, then we should be as well. We should say, Father, I desire to be like you. I want to reflect you. I mean, it's an amazing thing, but kids, they grow up in so many ways to be like their parents. Some of us pull our hair out trying not to be like our parents, but there's something in us, something about us. We just resemble our parents. And I think this is a limiting factor in our lives. Yes, you are free in Jesus Christ, but at the same time, you're a child of God. So you're not free to resemble another father, free to resemble another family. No, you should resemble the family that you now belong to. And so you must purify yourself, not out of some need to justify yourself or to prove yourself, but out of gratitude and out of this identity that you have in him. That calling is a limiting factor in your freedom. Number two, we're called not only as sons, but we're called as saints, as saints. You know, the saints are going to put a hurting today on the Arizona Cardinals. But that's not the kind of saints that I'm talking about. We hear saints and we think, ah, saints, you know, these are like dead people, dead Christians that have now gone on to heaven, and we have the opportunity to pray to them, for them to in some way mediate for us. This is so amazing to me that this doctrine, that this idea is prevalent in so much of Christianity. Because it is not just the dead in Christ who are called as saints, but 1 Corinthians 1-2 says that Paul is writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth. He is writing to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus and who are saints by calling. You know what God calls you? He calls you son. He calls you saint. <laughs> Me? I don't feel very saintly. But again... It's not about what you choose to call yourself. It's about what the Father called. Remember, this is his right. When you were born again, he had the right to name you, and he named you son, and he named you saint. Why are we saints? How are we saints? Because it says in the book of Ephesians that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And guess who is seated there with him? We are. We presently are seated with him in the heavenly places, though we be here on earth in our body, our spirit is seated with him because wherever he is, there we are also. We don't have to pray to someone else to intermediate between us and God. We get to pray to God directly because we have access into the throne of God. So what should we be doing with our lives if we're saints? I mean, how should this affect our thinking? Look at Colossians for a moment. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, 
Keep seeking the things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. How would it change your life if you began seeing yourself and thinking about yourself as one who is seated with Christ in the heavenly places? What would it look like if you started thinking not about things that are on earth, but thinking about things that are above? What if when you were in your workplace, you began recognizing, you know, I'm not just an employee here, but I'm a saint of God with his life in me, and I am to represent that. You see, there are some limiting factors in our lives. Our calling in Christ. Hey, if we're sons of God, we should reflect the purity of the Father. If we are saints of God, then our thinking should begin to change on that basis. To where we're going through life, not as people that are sort of trying to survive, but overwhelming conquerors who are seated in a position of authority alongside Jesus Christ. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be timid. But we can be bold, confident, and in His authority, go. And number three, we're called as slaves. Called as slaves. We've talked about this a little bit. It may not sound like the greatest identity, but again, it all depends on who you are enslaved to. If you're enslaved to a good master, hey, it's a pretty good position. And the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 22 that we have died to sin and we have been enslaved to God. And on that basis, we derive a benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. You have a master, and your master is a very good master. And if he is our master, how should that affect our lives? Some of us are living as if our obligation is to something else other than God. Well, I have an obligation to this, or I have an obligation to that. God gets squeezed out of our lives because of all these obligations that we have. The question I would ask you is, who is your master? Who do you serve? Because if you serve him, it seems like other things should be squeezed out. You know, I'm always amazed. There are some people that don't have time. They don't have time to be able to be an accountable Christian community. They don't have time to be in the Word of God. They don't have time regularly to assemble with other believers. They don't have time to be on mission. Don't have time to be serving in the community. And yet when I go to the baseball field on Monday night, I see him coaching there. And when I go to the baseball field on Tuesday night, I see him coaching there. Or I go to football. They're there. Listen, we make time for what's important to us and we make time for things that we have loyalty to, that we have affection for. And I would just suggest to you that if our identity is that of a son, that of a saint, that of a servant, a slave of God, then it should have some sort of outworking in our day-to-day lives. It should show in what we do and in how we do it. I want you to look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. One of the tendencies I see in so many of our lives is us trying to change our circumstances. If my circumstances changed, I would feel differently about me. But I want you to see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 21. Here Paul speaks to the people that are sort of the lowest of the low in society. He speaks to the slave. Slavery was an institution that was present in the first century. And here he speaks to the slave. He says, were you called... Because that's what we're talking about, right? Our calling. He says, were you called while you were a slave? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But if you're able to become free, sure, do that. But I don't want you to worry about it. Now that you're in Christ, I don't want you to worry about your physical freedom. Why? Because he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. You're God's freed man. So what does it matter if you're a slave on earth? And oh, by the way, that master that you serve, 
If he was called in the Lord while free, guess what he is? He is Christ's slave. He says, you were bought with a price. So don't become slaves of men. Don't become enslaved to people's perceptions about you. Well, you're this. You're this. I'm your superior. You're the inferior. Don't, don't, don't think about that. I mean, if you're the lowest of the low, realize in God's kingdom, the least are the greatest. And if on this earth you're the greatest of the great, realize that the first will be last. Hey, God always has the cure. <laughs> always. If we got a cough, he's got the syrup, and here it is. The humble will be exalted, and those who are exalted will be humbled. Hey, is life sort of handing you everything? Is it just going good for you right now? Do you know what you need? You need a good dose of identity. I'm God's slave. And in the midst of all of this prosperity, in the midst of all of this success, I'm not going to allow it to go to my head. But instead, I'm going to see myself as who I am and live in light of that. Is life sort of throwing you curveball after curveball after curveball? And you feel like you can't make progress. You're always treading water. You're like the hamster on the wheel. Realize, I'm not going to live like one who's being defeated, but I'm going to live like one who is the Lord's freed man. I'm going to allow my calling to determine what I do. I'm not just going to do whatever, whenever, however, but I'm going to allow it to be limited by my calling. I'm going to live like a son of God. I'm going to live like a saint. I'm going to live like a slave of Christ. I'm going to be content in the place that God has put me. Limiting factors in our freedom. Let's talk about a second one. Let's talk about conscience. Conscience. Again, it makes me think about childhood. You know, Pinocchio. Always let your conscience be your guide. Love that. I was a kid though, I was like, what is a conscience? I couldn't even say it. Conscience. You know, these days there are a lot of people may not really know what conscience is because you don't see a lot of conscience. But for us, a limiting factor in our freedom before the Lord is our conscience toward God. Now, let me tell you, if our calling in Christ is who we are, our conscience towards God has to do with what we do. This is where our actions do come into play. And whereas our calling is universal, we are all called with the same calling, son, saint, slave. Our consciences are going to vary a little bit. So let's talk for a moment about conscience. First of all, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.5 that his goal was love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Conscience was important to Paul. In fact, when he stood before Felix, a Roman governor, to defend himself, Paul did not defend himself on the basis of the law, but he defended himself on the basis of his conscience. He's like, you know what, Felix? I have a clear conscience right now before the Lord. So whether you judge me as guilty or whether you judge me as not guilty, I'm okay with that. Because my conscience toward God right now is clean. Conscience is that voice in your head that can keep you awake at night because you know you've done something you shouldn't have done. Conscience is that voice inside of you that can keep you awake at night because you know you're thinking about doing something and you really know that you should not be doing it. Conscience is that voice inside of you that makes your blood pressure go up when you were exposed and caught in the act. Here's what conscience is. Conscience is, first of all, internal. I want you to write this down. It is internal. It is a reflective mechanism that God has put in us by which we can measure our conformity to a norm. You know, at South, where my boys go into school, they have a system of checks. And students with good behavior, no checks. Students with bad behavior, get checks. One of the amazing things my boy keeps coming home and telling me is, Dad, there are kids who get checks, and they don't care about it. Listen, If he got one, he would be so worried, so concerned. Why is it, Dad, that they get check after check after check? It's because ultimately, there is no external standard that can change your behavior. But there is something internal that has to happen. There has got to be conscience. 
There's got to be conscience. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.2 that in the last times, there will be many whose consciences have been seared as with a branding iron. Listen, the conscience that God gives you is a blessing. There are times we think it's a curse. Man, I wish I didn't feel the way I do about this. Man, I wish that I had freedom in this area. I really wish I could participate in this. I think it would be a lot of fun, but there's something inside of me that's saying, don't do it. Listen to me. God has put inside of you an internal mechanism, a reflective mechanism, by which you can measure your conformity to a norm. Now, according to Jewish custom, that norm was the law. In fact, Paul in Romans chapter 2 talks about Gentiles. Gentiles who don't have the law, who've never heard the law of Moses. That even people that don't have the law of Moses do instinctively in the things in the law. They don't kill. They don't steal. They don't covet. And if they do, their conscience condemns them. Their conscience lets them know, hey, this is wrong. You should not do this. Even Gentiles who don't have the law have this idea of conscience, this voice inside that's saying, you shouldn't do this. But here's the thing. As Christians, our conscience is not based on the law, but our conscience is based on God himself. As we reflect on God, as we reflect on who he is and what he has done, our conscience is guided accordingly. Because, hey, a lawyer can argue himself out of the biggest mess. I mean, have you noticed this? And yeah, you watch law TV, right? These law shows. Hey, they can take a guy who's guilty as sin, right? And get him off scot-free. Why? Because of the technicality. But with God, there are no technicalities because it's not about written codes. It's about his holy character. And our conscience is based not on the law. It is based on God himself. And God has put in us this voice this voice that helps us to understand, am I conforming to the image of Christ or am I not? But here's something else I would say about conscience. Though it's internal, it's also irregular. In other words, the word is the same for all of us. We all have the same word. God's word doesn't change. It endures. But conscience can vary. I want you to look at Romans for a moment as you look at this. Romans 14, I want to show you where the source of many of your disagreements with your brothers and sisters come from and explain to you how you need to handle this. Romans chapter 14, verse 5. Here Paul's talking about principles of conscience. He says, one person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. What's he talking about? He's talking about holy days, Sabbaths, festivals. Some people in their conscience say, you know what? I need to honor the Sabbath day. Some people in their conscience say, you know what? I don't feel like I need to honor the Sabbath day. I feel like I'm going to live my entire life in a state of rest before the Lord. What does Paul say to that? He says, well, you know what? When it comes down to it on this, each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, how should he do it? He should do it for the Lord. I'm observing the day for you, Lord, to honor you, to glorify you. The one who eats should eat for the Lord, to give glory to the Lord. The one who doesn't eat, he should eat for the Lord's sake. The one who does not observe the day should not observe the day for the Lord's sake. Because he says, not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Here's what the Bible teaches about conscience. It is an internal mechanism that God has built into you. And yet conscience is going to vary somewhat between person and person. You may see somebody who does not have a conscience about a certain issue like you have. And what we will do is we will compare with them and say, well, you know what? They're doing it. It must be okay. And other people will look at us and say, they're not doing it. What is wrong with them? 
You know, they over there judging me for doing it. I mean, you got the people that feel free to do it, and then you got the people that don't feel free to do it, and the people that don't feel free to do it are sort of judging the people that are doing it. They shouldn't be doing that. And the people that are doing it are looking at the person not doing it. What's wrong with you? You must be weak in your faith. Or are you judging me? And you can have this sort of thing going on, right? No, we're not talking about clear principles of Scripture like don't kill, don't steal. No, no. We're talking about other matters, peripheral matters. It varies from person to person. What do we do about this conscience that God has given us? Well, the Bible says it is internal, and yes, it is irregular, but it also says it is inescapable. We cannot escape the dictates of conscience. James chapter 4, verse 17 says it this way. To one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. If you know the right thing to do and you don't, it's sin. Bottom line, are they doing it? Well, yeah, but I believe that if I participated, it would be sin for me. Listen, God has put a conscience in you. And he's put a conscience in you to keep you from evil. He knows you. And I believe one of the reasons why God puts different consciences in different people is because we all face different weaknesses. We all have different struggles. Some of us struggle with a substance. Some of us don't struggle with a substance. Some of us struggle with a situation. Others of us don't struggle with that situation. For some of us, a certain kind of music is going to bring up thoughts about an old way of lifestyle. Whereas others of us, we hear that, it doesn't raise that stuff. Hey, God puts the conscience in you that you need to have for you to become like Jesus Christ. And for you to ignore that is to do so to your peril. Because if you sear the conscience that God by His grace has given you, saying, well, I'm free in Christ, I can you haven't stopped to think about, should I? Should I? Would this be good? We say, well, what's wrong with it? I would ask you what's right with it. Why is this right for you? How is this helpful for you? What if we begin measuring things not by what makes it wrong, but what makes it right? We would be living by the dictates of our conscience. And we wouldn't just be doing willy-nilly whatever, but we would, I believe, more appropriately, more fully following the will of God for our lives. Hey, we're free in Christ, but we're also free to do certain things. Our calling in Christ limits our freedom. Our conscience toward God limits our freedom. Let me talk about one more thing, and that is our concern for others. Our concern for others. Our calling in Christ has to do with who we are, Our conscience toward God has to do with what we do, but our concern for others, hey, this is why we exist. Why do I exist? You know, the one word answer for that is, well, I exist to worship God. I exist to worship God. And yet the God who demands our worship says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 1 John 4, 20 and 21 says this, How can you love the God whom you've not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen? I mean, how can I say I love God when I'm hating on my brother, right? I mean, why do I exist? To worship God. Yes, but how do we do that? We do it by love. We do it by compassion, through consideration, through concern. The idea, I'm not the only one living in this house. I'm not the only one living on this street. I'm not the only one living in this neighborhood, in this city, in this state, in this country, in this world. It is not all about me. And God has put me here to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And my identity as such limits what I do. I mean, can I do whatever? Well, yeah, but there are times when that is going to go against my calling. My calling is his ambassador, and so my concern for others is going to be a limiting factor. Let me talk to you about two scenarios. First of all, let's talk about believers for a moment. Look at 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. When should I limit 
my right as a believer to do something. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's an antiquated, outdated example for us, but we can find applications in our day. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 8. Here Paul is talking about food that has been sacrificed to an idol. Animal sacrifice was a regular part of worship, not only in the temple in Jerusalem, but in pagan temples all throughout the Roman Empire. Some people were hung up. Ah, I shouldn't eat food sacrificed to idols. Others said, it doesn't matter. It is just food. <laughs> it's just food. That's all it is. There's no idol. There is no other God. None of that is real. So what does it matter? Notice what Paul says. Verse 8, food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. In other words, does it matter? No. Are you any worse off for eating the steak? Well, your heart doctor might say that you are. But before the Lord, you are no, wor no worse off. Are you better off if you eat the meat? No. You're neither the worse for it, nor the better for it. And here's the attitude some of us take. Well, if it doesn't matter, I'm just going to go ahead. Paul, however, says, concern for others, thinks differently. It thinks, if it doesn't matter, then I don't have to do it. And here's his advice. Verse 9. Take care that this liberty, this freedom of yours, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple... Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? I mean, think about the guy that just got saved out of paganism. Let's say you're the one that converted him to Jesus Christ, and then one day he walks by and he sees you eating the meat sacrificed to an idol. He may go, dude, you just told me I need to reject paganism, and now here you are eating meat. Well, there's really no such thing as an idol. It doesn't matter. You know, he may think, well... If it doesn't really matter, I guess I can do it too. But for him, there's association with that old way of life. It's sort of like offering a drink to a recovering alcoholic, right? It's like, man, I really need to stay away from that because it's not just about the drink. It's about everything that goes with the drink. It's about the people. It's about the places. It's about the habits. It's about all of that. Paul goes on to say here, Verse 11, through your knowledge, your knowledge of the fact that, yeah, there's no idol, there's no other God. Through this knowledge, the one who's weak is going to be ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died, and so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, who do you sin against? Christ. What's his conclusion? Well, if food causes my brother to stumble... I'll never eat meat again so that I won't cause my brother to stumble. See, there are limiting factors in our lives. As we begin to grow in our faith, it matters what we do. It matters where we are. Hey, when you're a little kid, it doesn't matter. Listen, my kids can do whatever at the house. In fact, they don't always do a ton in the way of chores and responsibilities, but as they're growing, we're giving them more and more and more. And in the same way, when you were first saved, you're just a baby in Christ. You're like, feed me. You know, put it in there, preacher. I need to be cared for. I need to be tended to. But as you grow, as you mature, suddenly people begin looking to you. Isn't this a weird moment? They're looking to you for guidance and looking to you for wisdom. Listen to me. In that moment... Your freedom is not your main concern. Your main concern is, how do I help this individual? And out of love for them, I'm going to limit myself in certain ways so that they can understand what is and is not right. We have a responsibility toward one another. Just like with our kids, we protect them. We should, with our brothers and sisters, protect one another. Not exercising our right but limiting our right. And the last thing I'll say, we have a responsibility and an obligation to non-believers, church. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to close that with this. Here the Apostle Paul says in verse 19, Though I am free from all men, 
I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. I'm free from all men. I have no obligation to them. No obligation to them. No responsibility to them. I'm free from them. I'm in Christ, right? But though I'm free from all of these men, I have made myself a slave to all men so that I may win more. I'm not enslaved to them in that I'm looking to them for approval or I'm looking to them for justification. No, I'm enslaving myself to them so that I can reach them with a message of justification in Christ. I'm enslaving myself to them so I can lead them to a place of freedom. He says to the Jews, I become as a Jew so that I might win Jews. I learned Jewish customs. In fact, he already knew them. I practice those things as much as I am able. Right? This is what missionaries do. To those who are under the law, I become as one under the law. Though I'm not under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who don't have the law, I become as one without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. And I, oh my goodness, what if we could say this? I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. What a life verse. I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Why did you do that? For the sake of the gospel. Why did you think that? For the sake of the gospel. Why did you go there? For the sake of the gospel. Not because, well, I got the right to do it. What's wrong with it? Huh? Hey, I'm saved. Free. In Christ. You got something to say about that? No. That's not the way Paul thought. I'm going to do everything I do for the sake of the gospel so that I might win someone. So I can bring someone to Jesus Christ. Here's the point of all this. We think that freedom in Christ is the climax, the high point of the lessons in God's grace. But let me tell you what happens. And this is what life looks like. As we're growing, we're experiencing greater and greater and greater freedom. Greater and greater opportunity. We realize the whole world lays before us. But then comes this turning point for us when we realize it is not all about me. And what we begin to do then is we begin to crest. And in terms of our freedom, we realize freedom is not what matters the most. What matters are the lost. Freedom is not what matters most. What matters is my brother who is struggling. My personal right to eat. My personal right, Paul would say, to marry. My personal right to do this is nothing compared to the spiritual welfare of those who are around me. And a Christian life cycle is one of ever-increasing freedom, followed by a point of realization. It's not all about me. And giving one's life in sacrifice and service for others. My friends, that is the lesson of forbearance. And that is our fourth grace lesson. Listen, church is great. Christianity is great when it's all coming and it's all coming easy. But here's what God calls us to do. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You want to hear a confession from your pastor? It would be easier not being a pastor How's that on Pastor Appreciation Month, right? It would be so much easier. There are some times when I sort of think, man, it'd be really nice just to come to church, just to go to a group, just to receive, and not think about sharing and speaking and leading. But let me tell you, those thoughts are fleeting. And those thoughts are so rare compared to the reality that God's got me here for a purpose that is bigger than me. And I believe that's not just true because I'm a pastor. I think that's because I'm a Christian. I think that's the way Christians should think. And I think that is the way every one of us should be thinking. And I don't hold myself up as a model. I'm just trying in a very imperfect way to reflect the example of, of Scripture. But each of us should be doing that as well. And my question to you is, 
What are you doing to take on your responsibility as a follower of Christ, as a son, as a saint, as a servant? What are you doing to follow the dictates of your conscience, even when it means doing something that, eh, people don't think it's a big deal, but you know it is. What are you doing? Not because you have the right to do it, but you're doing it for the sake of someone beyond you so that they may know the Lord. My friends, only in that moment do we understand fully the message of grace. Let's not not let these lessons escape us. Let's not forget them. Let's live them.